Welcome to the How to Find and Keep a Gay Man podcast. I'm Matt Bays, your host, with Matt Heinker, your co-host. And we're here to provide bitchy wisdom for the gay man looking for love. There are a lot of gay men out there looking for a meaningful love experience, and we are here to help. You can follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok, where you'll find all sorts of bitchy wisdom about what it's going to take to find and keep a gay man. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Matt just got home from church with six children. Church and brunch with six children. So I'm just, you know, I'm shifting mindsets now and I'm ready. Good. <laughs> I was with some friends the other day and they, we were sitting down to dinner. It was a gay couple. And he goes, Terry, turn down the light. Lord, I can't sit here. He goes, well, honey, if we dim them too much, we're eventually going to be in the dark. <laughs> there has to be a Medicare setting. Don't you? <laughs> I, get, okay. I, get, I get the Medicare setting. Fall that away. Okay. So welcome to How to Find and Keep a Gay Man. This is a wonderful, wonderful episode because we are having our very first guest on to the podcast. So we want to welcome clinical psychologist extraordinaire, Alicia B. Bridgeland. Yes, sir. Yes. You endorsed my book. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and we spent some time together. And so being able to have you on is really, really a wonderful thing. And basically, we just need you to answer all of ours and all of the gay world's questions. <laughs> well, I think that can be accomplished. Welcome, we Alicia. Got- Good to have you. Thanks, Matt. Yes. And take a little sip of your of your coffee there just for Matt. Just Matt's <laughs> little surprise. Oh, I saw it. She's helping us push the merch today. Thank you, Alicia. Mm-hmm. Yes. The show them your heart, not your part mug. I made sure she got the good part. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Alicia, why don't you do us just a, a brief little intro of who you are? Okay. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice, and I do about 65 hours of therapy a week. I treat adolescents and adults, um, gay, straight, black, white, all kinds of folks. And I've been in practice uh, for about 15 years. 15 years. Yes. And 65 hours a week. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot going on out there. Yeah. Okay. I have had sessions with you where you're like, how's six in the morning on Friday? And I'm like, well, I'm sorry. (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) Wow. Man, I'm not kidding. We're, I don't I, I, I don't like it. We're getting up early. Sleep <laughs> makes you weak. Yes, or, <laughs> or Chris has been rolling around the bed at 5 30. He's like, I gotta go. I'm gonna be late. I'm like, for what? I have a session with Alicia. I'm like, what the hell? It's 5 30 a.m. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, for all that you're doing, for two people, I think I can say this that have richly benefited from uh, therapy over the years. Just a big fat thank you for the work that you're doing, uh, especially in the LGBTQ plus community, how desperately we need it. Absolutely. Yes. Our hope for this podcast and for this whole platform, How to Find and Keep a Gay Man, is to help people who have a desire to be in a long-term or forever relationship and find what we would call a meaningful love experience that they can, knowing that there are plenty of people out there that either aren't ready for that or don't desire that. So we know we're not for everyone, but we are for gay men who are like, I'm tired of the hookup life, feels empty to me, or it feels like a dead end, or I've been in and out of relationship, a lot of the same patterns established, Mm -hmm. and I would like to do something new, which we always say, get a damn therapist and do your work. So we know that it's a struggle for people to figure out how to arrive at that place where they have love to offer and are also able to receive it. So perfectly can, said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah. yeah. So can you speak to us about that, Alicia? Well, I think that um, the the current hookup culture is not working for anyone. Okay. Um, and I, I believe because there is a drive in the brain that is the strongest drive and it is for love. It's in the same place in the brain as hunger and thirst. Wow. Yeah. And so this Mm. drive for love uh, 
can't be accomplished with a series of relationships because it's sex, but it's not intimacy. Intimacy is seeing into me. It is being vulnerable. I've worked with couples who will, because of medical conditions or age, will never have sex again. And they are intimate and connected and in love. So I think love is the most important thing. And to go for that and to have that be the objective is probably the way to the most promising relationships. Ooh. It's also, you know, the, the the part about finding a gay man. I am married to a straight man. And since we got married, have not been dating. He's super controlling. Um, <laughs> and, so I had to ask some folks, how do you find a gay man? That was the piece that I didn't know how to keep him. Like how to get anybody, I think I've got. So I, I did a little research and I I thought it was very interesting. In my age group, um, which is the baby boomers, only 2.6% of people identified as LGBT. Today, wow. in our Generation Z, which is your 20 to 26, it's 21%. Whoa. More than one in five. Yeah. So it depends on what age group you're in to start. If you're between the ages of 27 and 42, about 11% of folks out there identify as LGBTQ. If yeah. you're in the generation X, which is 43 to 58, only 4%. So younger has a better chance of finding. And so then you think about what are the venues in which I could possibly meet and connect with? Is it the gay bar scene? Probably not, just like it's not the straight bar scene. So in researching ways to find a gay man, I uh, asked my friend Perrin Lampy, who recommended Hot Mess Sports League. It's an all-inclusive community that has various sports and hosts LGBTQ plus events and allies are welcome and it's good fun for all. I love that it's Hot Mess Sports. So listen, that implies you don't have to be good at sports, which is pretty cool. Yeah. No, I don't think Violent. you have to be good at sports. I think you have to be of good cheer. So yeah, I love it. And so there's a place. Um, if you're an intellectual, you go to the library. If you're an adventurer, you go skydiving. So go do the kinds of things that you like to do. And that's where you'll meet people of same interests. And Alicia, not to back up too much, but I'm very, I'm just absolutely blown away by the stats you just listed. Mm -hmm. So a 21% of mm -hmm. 20 to 26 year olds identify as somewhere on the LGBTQ plus continuum. According, yeah. according to Gallup 2021. Yeah. And so do you think that this is a result of, you know, the, the stigma of being in our community is being lifted over time. And so people are more comfortable or do you think that that is falsely padded because people are more experimental? What do you, th I'm just curious what you think about I think, that. I think it's falsely padded because it's trendy. I am currently in the least cool group, old, <laughs> old white, straight woman who's boy crazy. I mean, <laughs> absolute least, but, but I think, yeah. you know, I, I see teenagers and their parents will say to me, you know, my daughter has eight friends. Three of them are gay. Two of them are bi. Two of them are trans. And one is deciding. Now, I don't know that this is something you decide, but the numbers simply don't support that. Yeah. So I think it is trendy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether when I was in high school, if no boys paid attention to me, whether I might want to hook up with my BFF girlfriend. I don't know, but I think that you're seeing some sexual experimentation in same genders, more girls than boys. And so I think there is a trendiness to it. But to your point, I think there's also a lot more permission for people to be their genuine selves to sure. say, hey, my heart and body compels me to this. And that yeah. feels OK to me. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it sure is. So that's. That's the first piece. And then there's some other things to think about. Um, I think Helen Fisher, I'm a big fan of Dr. Helen Fisher, anthropologist, researcher. Um, she is she's brilliant. And um, she has she has identified some ways in which we can kind of determine um, uh, whether or not a partnership will work. Timing and proximity, for example, 
if he lives in Cleveland and has children he can't leave and you live in Cincinnati, it's not going to work. If he's a senior and you're in eighth grade, he has all those life things to go through. And so it's not going to work. But if he's 39 and you're 35, fine. So those are the things that you think about. The other things to think about are ethnic and socioeconomic backgrounds, um, the degree of intelligence, even the degree of good looks. If you have a partner who is very, very intelligent and a partner who's not so, the more intelligent partner can get bored and it can and lead to, to disrespect. Um, I think similar religious values are important. You don't have to be the same religion, but you have to kind of honor what your partner is going through and reproductive goals. You know, mm -hmm. if he is champion at the bit for IVF and you love the single life, that's going to be a problem. I think all of those cultural things. And then, you know, what is your social climbing status? Do you want to be that, you know, social person or, you know, is your partner a minimalist who just, you know, is fine with living simply? So yeah. those are kind of some of the things mm -hmm. that we think about. The other thing I love about Dr. Fisher's work <clears throat> She actually talks beyond personality indices about the fMRI research on brain types and the neural personality structures. And she's identified four of them. And you can take her quiz and determine which of those personalities you are and then see how you might be in relationship with someone with his personality structure. So um, just, just to back up a little bit, when you were talking about uh, different socioeconomic level or different life values, hopes for kids or not kids, or one is an adventure seeker and another one likes to sit home and binge Netflix. Uh, a lot of what Matt and I talk on here about is uh, pairing, good pairing yes. or bad pairing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's hard to find and understand maybe in your early 20s when I initially got married because yeah. you love someone. And it might sound crazy, but sometimes I'm like, be careful how much time you spend with someone that you are infatuated with, but you know, is probably not going to be good for you because honey, you don't want to fall in love with that person and lose 10 years of your life <laughs> or more. Yeah. Or other, 23. <laughs> the other thing to pay attention to is, is the dopamine rush that comes with early romantic love. I brought some books here because there's some books that folks should read. Yes. The Molecule of More. Okay. It, talks, okay. it talks about dopamine. How a single chemical in your brain drives love, sex, and creativity and will determine the fate of the human race. No oversell on this book. <laughs> wow. So the part that I like the best about this is it talks about when you get that dopamine rush, when you meet that person and you're so excited about them. According to the research, the dopamine shifts after about 12 to 18 months from this romantic rush, I can't wait to see him, dopamine, to a companionate dopamine. Now, don't misunderstand that that's old people, no sex love. You can be 23. And after 18 months, it shifts from, oh my God, did he text me? To mm -hmm. oh, he texted me. There's a difference. but the, And the dopamine actually changes. So I think it's important that we give bread time to rise. And that these relationships are not entered into in a permanent way before they've had a chance to percolate. And according to the research, that's 12 to 18 months. Now, yeah. I have patients who meet people, they fall in love. My in-laws got married, I think, after four months, and they were happily married for 65 years. So <laughs> there certainly are exceptions. But I would, I would challenge folks that think that they've found the one to let it go through a season to see holidays and and to let the the relationship grow and develop. What do you think about people who are older and have lived some life like, you know, Matt, you and Chris, they said you just knew it. I'm just curious what you, how you think that factors in. I think that you've had the benefit of life experience. And I think that's yeah. really, really important. So caution to the younger. But mm -hmm. if you've had and know what you don't want, that also is helpful. And then you've sure. also had the experience of having been married or having been in a long-term relationship where you learn how to make concessions and learn yeah. what parts of self you're willing to give up 
and what parts you're not. And for any couple, I would always recommend couples therapy. I see couples who are dating. They're not married and they're not unhappy. They just want to learn what their neuro personality type is. And mm-hmm. as importantly, what their attachment styles are. Yeah. You know, you're either secure attachment, anxious attachment, or avoidant attachment. And if you have a partner with anxious attachment, it's going to be pretty irritating if he wants to know when you're going to be home and where you're going. And and you might not understand that unless you understand his attachment. And so those are things that you learn in therapy. Sure. And so in that example, which I love, because I think that my go-to in my, if I get unhealthy, is going to be anxiously Mm -hmm. attached Mm -hmm. uh, just because of a fear of abandonment, you know, a lot of stuff from my childhood. Uh, So what is the answer for somebody who that's where they get on the struggle bus? Because I think we can be like, you need to grow up and you need to just stop being anxiously attached. Well, I think that's complicated. I think the most important thing that you can know is your partner's early childhood. And whenever I have a new patient, I always do a family map, which looks like a kaleidoscope of circles where We have the person, the person's partner, children, if they have them, and then every person in each partner's family of origin with descriptions, including their parents and grandparents. Because if I grow up with a loving, nurturing, warm mother and an attentive, loving father, I'm a very different person than if I grew up with a drug using father and a mother who was depressed and emotionally unavailable. So it's as important to know your partner's childhood as just about anything else about him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would think for me, it would help when I see somebody in struggling with a weakness. It doesn't mean I have to fully accept it, but, or engage in it, but that I can say, I know where this comes from. And even in a safe, trusting relationship, be able to say, Hey, I think we can do better here. Like, let's look at this and talk about it. Yeah, And I think in a loving relationship, you can make concessions. Mm -hmm. And an example I think of is, is a couple, his mother was so critical. You know, if, uh, if you got a 98, did anybody get a hundred? Are you really going to wear your hair like that? And so knowing that the person that she loves comes from a critical environment, an example that I use is if, if she were to say, for example, uh, did you get the mail? What she just means is, is the mail here or do I need to get it? You know, he hears, why in the heck didn't you get the mail? That's what mm-hmm. he hears. And she mm-hmm. hasn't said that. And we mm-hmm. can't change him exactly. But she can say, I'm going to get the mail. And if he's gotten it, he'll say, I already got it. So mm-hmm. being in tune with your partner and sure. looking at how siblings treated one another, how parents treated one another. Mm-hmm. It's critical to being the most empathic, compassionate, and helpful partner you can be. I love that. Just the other day, this just happened. And Chris doesn't say a lot to me about my behavior or something that's annoying him or whatever, but he was talking to me about something and I do a lot of teasing. And mm-hmm. I teased him and it wasn't the best time to do it. Could she, I can't imagine. Would there ever could, not be the best time? <laughs> I could see it in his face though. I could see like, this wasn't a good moment for him. And I said, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm teasing. And he goes, it's okay. And I said, are you, are you all right? And he goes, yeah. He goes, actually just sometimes in those moments, I wonder where that comes from. And I said, how do you mean? And he said, I wonder if like with your brother, That there was just so much of having to fight him, which there was, that Mm -hmm. you have to like stay on your toes or put yourself out there first or what. It was less about what he said. And it was more about him looking into my past and trying to understand from another place, which I really appreciated. And also was holding myself accountable. Like I need to be careful of those moments that Mm -hmm. that happens without me even knowing it. So we're both sort of, I'm correcting. And he was actually pointing something out. I I thought that was fascinating. So anyway, what you just said, I think I experienced this week. And that's what love looks like. I've developed Mm -hmm. a way of thinking about my own language in relationship. And I just called it scripting. And I got the idea Mm -hmm. 
when I was walking out of the bedroom through the family room and my husband was reading and I said, good morning, what are you reading? And he said, a book. (laughs) I walked into the kitchen and I got my coffee and I scripted it. Wife, good morning. What are you reading? Husband, a book, paren, you dumb shit, close paren. (laughs) And so I walked back into the family room and I said, what do you imagine it would be like if I were reading and you asked me what I was reading? And I said, a book. And he said, honey, honey, no, it's just I'm at the end of the chapter and it's a, like a really long military title and I don't have like, oh, OK. And I said, <laughs> you said that. Or you could have said, wait. So scripting can help you with your partner. If you say something and your partner responds in a way that just doesn't feel good, think about if it were a script and you're reading the script, Matt, such and such and such and such, other person, such and such. What does it look like? Oh, that offended me. But I think if I were reading that play, it wouldn't. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. We're going to switch gears and I want to ask you a couple more questions. You mentioned the dopamine Mm -hmm. and I don't know if those were attachment styles or what those were, but there were four of those. Yes. Okay. Those are the neural personality structures. Okay. Can we talk about that? Yes, please. So um, Helen Fisher, who I really admire, wrote a book called Why Him, Why Her? It can be Why Him, Why Him, okay? <laughs> or Why Them, Why They? Um, and what Dr. Fisher does brilliantly beyond this personality type of testing is with fMRI research, she identifies four principal neurotransmitters in our brains that create attributes in each of us. And the four are dopamine, and these are the explorers. They like adventure. They're romance junkies. They will take risks. The second type is principally serotonin. They're the builders. They're interested in family. They are the pillars of society. They will follow the rules. They will respect authority. They like schedules. They like routines. Is that you, Matt? I'm not a rule follower, but uh, okay. the other things track. Yeah. You're a pillar of society. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and we can be an amalgam of these things, Matt. It's yeah. not, it's not okay. a purity. The third type is testosterone. And these are the directors. These are the ones that value intelligence and, you know, think Steve Jobs, you know, think um, presidents of companies and they are analytical. For example, the owner's manual of my car, I have never opened it. I have absolutely no interest. My husband would go through it page by page. Okay. That's a testosterone quality I simply don't have. Now, I was in brand management for 10 years before I was a psychologist, and I bet you that my testosterone was higher during those corporate days because Mm -hmm. you're doing more things that are competitive and analytical. Mm -hmm. The fourth of the neural personality types is the estrogen type, and these are the negotiators. They have passion. They are empathic. They read people beautifully because they're more emotional. And this isn't a a man-woman thing um, because you know many men who are empathic and warm and value uh, nurturance. And you know many women who are driven. And so this isn't a male-female thing. But if you if you want to find out why him, why her, the test is in this book and lays out the different types. And so if you're a dopamine junkie, you are not going to be wanting to sit home with Mr. Schedules. Right. <laughs> and if you are a scheduled person, you're not going to want to be hanging out with the guy who wants to go bungee jumping. Now, you have to be careful if two dopamine junkies are together, they may struggle with wanting to find romance in different places, I think. Or if they have children together, maybe the children are feral while they're out skydiving. So, you know, there would be things you'd want to you'd want to watch. If I think about a serotonin couple, um, they would be the ones sitting home watching the seasons of their TV shows that they love. Uh, so you need to think about that. When I when I treat lesbian couples, 
who are both high estrogen, they can be codependent. They can fight a lot. So we have to work on just understanding that about your partner. Well, so who goes together? Okay, good uh, question. According to Dr. Fisher, the dopamine folks go, who are explorers go best with the explorers. The serotonin mm. folks who are the builders go best with the builders. Now, this also, I think, depends on the quality of this. So, for example, if I'm a really organized, scheduled man who marries an explorer, we can maybe complement one another. I can keep him on track. He can keep me on track. That would make sense to me. Ironically, the testosterone and estrogen do better when they cross. So estrogen, testosterone, testosterone, estrogen. Mm -hmm. Less, according to Dr. Fisher, uh, the estrogen is so high estrogen, it can sometimes incite violence in the testosterone partner because of subjugation. So taking this quiz, knowing what you are, and knowing how to help your partner by focusing on his strengths. I don't think there are weaknesses. I think there are areas of opportunity and being sensitive. You know, you love this guy. You want to be the best partner you can be. You know, I think that these are really important dynamics to understand and really you know, have making taking your relationship to the next level or really enriching it to its fullest. You know, but what we see prevalent in a lot of people in our community is the inability to attach at all or to think that they deserve love or when they find somebody even that's good, that Matt and I would call a good pair. We don't have the ability to see it through and even get to the level where we're digging deep enough to understand each other's attachment styles um, and things like that. So I'm curious what you would have to say about that specifically. I think good therapy is indicated, you know, both yeah. in couples. And I don't say that because I have a dog in the hunt. I say that because in my program, we weren't allowed to be therapists unless we went to therapy. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you kidding me? I'm not anxious. I'm not depressed. My dissertation's almost done. It was the most valuable thing I ever did because it helped mm -hmm. me understand why I feel anxious about certain things that maybe other people wouldn't feel anxious about. I always have my patients, uh, the ones who are verbal and can do the work, do a critical events map, which is a, a list of salient memories, good and bad, which form themes that we have about ourselves. So if Matt and I are in the first grade and the teacher says, Alicia and Matt, you're going to be in the slow reading group. And I think, score, we get to read the little books and more time for recess. I might not even remember that. But if Matt thinks, oh, I'm with the dumb kids, that's a little T trauma that will stay with him as a theme, possibly for the rest of his life. Yeah. So, so you want to go back with your therapist and rewrite the narrative, not literally, but figuratively to understand what your themes are. And some of them need to be refuted. If I believe because my mother was, let's say, emotionally unavailable, that I am not deserving of love. That's a faulty schema. And so you have to go back and think, what about this person is so deserving of love? And how does he take the risk? And I think the mother-child relationship is the most important. Fathers are very important too, but the early bonds with mom, if she has postpartum depression, if she is not available, uh, if she uses drugs and alcohol, a child can get the idea that he's not worthy and that needs to be refuted. What I'm hearing is there's work involved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's not just going to happen. And uh, another theme that we hit on, Alicia, is you can have all of this information. You can listen to this episode and have all the information and even, you know, go out and talk to people about it and give all of that information as if there's understanding. It's different having the knowledge than it is actually living and going through it. That's right. And when you look at relationships, there's some basic rules that if you can just think about the relationship, maybe that you're currently in um, a Gottman model, uh, John Gottman does mm -hmm. most of the really critical work on couples and you need three things. You need friendship, you need shared values. So the shared values are that they're both good citizens. They both, uh, Nobody cheats on their taxes. They're good parents. I mean, so, so those are the shared values. 
And the third one is a good physical, intimate relationship. Intimacy is critical. In fact, you know, in Dr. Fisher's work, she kind of laid out the things that every relationship needs based on brain science. And the first is novelty. I mean, you can't get stale in a relationship. The novelty releases dopamine. So if every night you do the same thing, you're not going to get that dopamine hit in your brain that is critical to sustain a relationship. So maybe you mix it up. You go to a different restaurant. I have couples write adventures and put them in a jar and just pull it out. And that's what we're doing Saturday night. Um, Hmm. If you have very different interests, you know, if he wants to go see Maverick and he wants to go see the Bridges of Madison County, you alternate. You mentioned the three things were friendship. Shared values. And a good physical relationship. Those are critical. That's the Gottman model. Helen Fisher says that you have to have novelty, mix it up. You have to stay in touch. And her Mm. research suggests that with touching, we release oxytocin in our brains, which lowers anxiety, stress, your blood pressure, and actually increases memory. Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. So touch your partner. It's really important. And also regular sex for oxytocin. And I see so many couples where they say, well, we've kind of lost interest in sex. Get it back. It's important. How do you get it back? How do you get it back? You do sensate exercises. Uh, What does that mean? You stand naked in front of a mirror and you talk about what you like about each other's bodies. Oh, wow. Yeah. You that have... just sounds fun to me. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and the other thing is you make affectionate comments. You know, have you ever mm-hmm. heard the expression, I didn't think he was that good looking and then I got to know him and he, I just think he's super attractive. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's because there's actually a place as we get to know somebody where we we have positive illusions about them based on illusions. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, yeah. we, you know, we want to do that. We think about them. And, and these positive illusions are the ability to look past the negative. When we continue to be attracted to our partner who is aged and we don't care, we still think he's darling, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe he's <laughs> lost his hair or maybe he's gained weight and we just don't care. And those are the positive illusions. I love that. That's, That's beautiful. Yeah. Those positive comments, you know, I really love you. I really appreciate that you, um, you know, I was thinking about you today. I'm so glad we're together. You know, all of those release this, this being in love, oxytocin. And it's, it's different from sex because the sex drive is from testosterone. That's the drive. And, you know, that's the neurotransmitter that makes us want to have sex. Romantic love is norepinephrine and serotonin. So that's very different from the oxytocin that is attachment love. So have you ever held a baby and you're just kissing their little heads and smelling their little heads so much? Okay, that's not romantic love. That's not sex drive. That's attachment. And you're just dumping oxytocin for that deep attachment to that child. And so if you could do that with, it's different from attraction, which is like, whoa, you know, I like that person. It's clearly different from sex. If you can get that deep attachment, that's what, that's what keeps you in relationship. And that, yeah. that kind of speaks to what we talk about, Matt, with our listeners. We, you have to tend to your garden every day, staying in tune with your partner. I love that. Those are, and that's neurologically what's happening when we do that. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's important to create both waking and bedtime rituals and rituals for the day. I have couples, you know, they talk about, well, you know, I'm a night owl and I'm on my computer till two o'clock in the morning. And my partner goes to bed at eight because he's getting up at four. They're missing it. They Mm -hmm. have to retool that. They have to awaken together and they have to go to bed together. And anything you have to do to meet in the middle is critical. And then any affirming ritual, bringing him a cup of coffee every morning, Mm -hmm. um, texting, I'm thinking about you. Those nourish the relationship. Uh, If you read Wired for Love, Stan Tykin talks about 
um, looking each other in the eyes and how very important that is because everything about us ages except our eyes. The energy in our eyes, the, uh, the ability to see your partner's soul. Many of us can go through a whole day and not gaze into our partner's eyes for a sustained period. And it's really, really important. My husband and I have a song. Anytime it comes, I don't care what we're doing, we're dancing. Um, the kids are eye rolling and saying things like, oh, God, old people <laughs> love. But it's important, you know, have a song, have a favorite, whatever it is, have a ritual and look into each other's eyes. It's really, really important. I did not know that until I read Wired for Love. And I was so glad to learn that because, you know, in the busyness of your day, you can talk to your partner. You know, you can even kiss your partner. You can fall asleep with your partner and not look into his eyes. That's astounding to me. Mm, that's a takeaway for me today. For sure. I love that. And I love the idea that the eyes don't age. There's something yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you told me once, Alicia, that you'll work a very long day and come home to a gourmet meal and a glass of wine from right. your husband. Right. I could not do my work without my husband. Zero percent chance because he understands that the stress of doing psychotherapy. And I also can't go home and tell him about my day because it's all private. So I'll go home. And in retirement, my husband started cooking. And I can tell you, I'll go home to grilled lamb chops, grilled bok choy, uh, <laughs> arugula salad with avocado. And that's a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And so there is no way I could do this work without him. And so as a pairing, that allows me to do that work. And with our healing place in Kentucky, he does all the care for that so that I can have clinicians who are struggling with stress or burnout go to the healing place. And often he's cooking for them and I'm talking to them. And if their heart's broken, I'm getting them on dating apps. And speaking of, I have to ask this question. Okay, I get match.com. I get eHarmony. What is the story with Grinder? That sounds like so much Grinder. Oh, hallelujah. Grinder got you good and ground, honey. You it's, have asked, you've come to the right place for it answers. Sounds like so much work. Everything oh, else oh, oh, is so oh. gentle. E harmony. Man. Yes. Grinder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> grind him. Answer this for me. What what? It is the horrific because he had a little bit more experience with the old <laughs> grinder. Mm. See, I think first and foremost. In our community, it's expected if you're single that you're on Grinder, first of all. But it's this horrific place where you go primarily to hook up or have your self esteem shot at. Oh. And it, you know, I don't know if I've ever met anyone that is in relationship that met on Grinder. I mean, I'm sure it happens, but it's really a side effect of a lot of the negative things in our community. People don't believe that they deserve love, don't have the tools to or emotional maturity, haven't dealt with their stuff enough to really even be ready to be in a real relationship. And so they all grind and scruff and all the other ones yeah. that are really designed just at hookup. So Matt and I always talk about, and we talked about mostly in the beginning, the people that are listening here are either tired of grinder or have no interest in it because they really want something more. We've established that that's not a place to go for anything real. Oh, we say that grinder is McDonald's. <laughs> Yeah, it's fast and it's easy and it's cheap. It's McDonald's drive through. <laughs> yes, yes it's it McDonald's, is. not filet mignon. I think that's on our TikTok page somewhere. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, and I, I have seen some of the some of the websites and I have patients who've done very well. I have patients who found friendship because that's what they're looking for. But I just thank you for clarifying that because I was just not getting it. Yeah, well, and, and speaking of this, tell us. The truth, no holds barred, about the hookup culture and what it is doing to us. <sighs> yes. Prevalent among young people, um, but also by your report in the gay male community, there is a dynamic of hooking up 
and having absolutely no relationship ever. My patients report to me that they are perfectly comfortable texting someone and inviting that person, for example, to come over and have sex and very clearly inviting them for that. And I think, okay, so let me get this straight. You want me to drive over there and service you and then drive home because I wouldn't stay because it would be awkward. (laughs) What is that about? And what I think is happening is the dynamic when you repeat anything, it's like exposure therapy. You know, if you're afraid of something, we always use exposure and response prevention. You're afraid of spiders. We expose you to the feared stimulus in a safe place and prevent your response, which would reduce your anxiety systematically, 90% effective. I think the same is true with the hookup culture. So if I have never in my life seen the ocean, the first time I see the ocean, it is amazing. It is life-changing. If I go to the ocean every day, there is nothing about that that is thrilling. And the example I think of, because I worked in substance abuse treatment, a woman shared with me, the first time you smoke crack, it is the most orgasmic, special experience you've ever had in your life. And she said, and honey, I spent the rest of my life chasing that because you never get it back. With the hookup culture, you're having random, very uh, short-lived sex fast. There's generally not a lot of foreplay. It's the hookup. And then you leave because, ew, we don't want to talk to each other. And when you do that enough times, I think your brain gets conditioned that there is not only no thrill with it anymore, but it's it's empty and it's very lonely. And the same is true for pornography because you can train your brain and there is There is research, maybe your audience isn't interested in this, but women's genitalia are digitally remastered in pornography to represent about, you know, single digit percent of women. So teenage boys masturbating to porn, they look at that. That's what they, their brains get conditioned that this is what it is to be, to have sex. And then they have a perfectly normal girlfriend who is not screaming about how great they are. Duh. Um, And then what happens? It's not enough. And so I think we train our brains that loving plain vanilla is not good enough. And so I think the hookup culture and social media, and I mean, my gosh, there's now OnlyFans. You can have a subscription to see pictures of people you don't know. Yeah, so, so what what is it in this hookup culture when somebody is engaging in this over and over and they can't seem to break that cycle? Maybe they don't even want to break that cycle. What is that doing to their brain chemistry? How is that altering their ability to attach, their yeah. ability to have a meaningful love experience? It's all testosterone because it's just sex. There's not attraction. Many of these teenagers and, and, and college students report to me, they are not attracted to this person. So there is not that attraction and and those neurotransmitters, and there's no attachment. There's no oxytocin, which feels like being in love. Mm -hmm. There's none of it. So it's really sad in a way because it's, you know, you don't get that dopamine of that romance and you don't get that norepinephrine. So you don't have the romance you don't have the attachment. All you have is the sex and that's not enough. So you're essentially kind of training yourself to just have a taste for the testosterone because the dopamine and oxytocin, these people might not ever really experience it. Yeah. So, so if I have someone to whom I'm not attracted, but with whom I know I can have sex and I do that repeatedly, And there's no attachment. That's not even on the table. It feels lonely. So the reason we repeat it is because we're looking for that, but it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we may not even be looking for it. We may just be looking for the ease and simplicity of hooking up and not having the drama of having a relationship with another human being. And someone who only wants that, Mm -hmm. 
is in what place in their psychologically in their life? What's the profile of that person? It varies. It's it's a yeah. lot. It's a lot of it. And this is not sexual addiction. That's very different. Yeah. Uh, this is a hookup culture. And I had read once, and this is why I don't think it particularly works for women, but I read once that when a woman orgasms, she secretes a hormone that makes her want to mate for life, the attachment hormone. Okay, that's why men fall asleep and women want to tell you their life history. Okay, <laughs> when two men, it's going to be different, but it's it's not something that's sustainable because love is the biggest drive. We want love. We want that person who loves us and is attached to us and we feel romantic about. And sure, we have great sex, but we have everything. We have the whole complete profile. So even the people that come to Matt and I and say, I don't want a long-term relationship. I certainly don't want to get married, but I don't want a long-term relationship. I'm perfectly happy with hookups or short terms or whatever. Those people have not done enough work to even be aware of the fact that they biologically want more. I would suggest a, an anxious or ambivalent attachment in childhood. And if they can drill down on that and figure out what aspects maybe of their upbringing was missing and what a partner might bring to that to nourish the wounded parts of them. Get a damn therapist. Get a get damn, a damn therapist. <laughs> we say it every week. That's yeah. right. So you can have a lovely partner that can nourish the damaged parts of you. I love that. I'm going to write that down. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Alicia, one of the reasons that I'm glad that we have you on here is because we can get the science behind some of this stuff that um, one of the things for, for me that I don't represent as full on the truth. I more represent it as a, a core group of us that do believe in monogamy mm -hmm. versus polyamorous or mm -hmm. open relationships is a huge deal in the gay community and is becoming even more popular. And they say things like, we were never meant to be with one person. If you look mm -hmm. in the animal kingdom, if you look historically, la la la, all that kind of stuff. And I don't have the science behind this. I've never had a desire to be polyamorous. I know that I have the capability to go out and have sex with a bunch of people. I don't want that. And I feel extremely protective that Chris and I do not put each other in a situation where mm -hmm. that could happen because I don't want to lose what I've got. Right. I don't want to even risk or step near that line because what I have is such a beautiful thing that I cherish mm -hmm. and I just, I don't want to fuck it up. Yeah. And that's important. I mean, the, the point that those whose science will say is correct. 97% of animals do not make pair bonds. They just don't. Um, what I know anecdotally from patients who invite a partner into maybe the established pair bond, in every case, one of the partners has ended up with a third party brought in to the established pair bond. So I don't think we are secure enough as people in our, in our bodies, our performance, to have a series of others evaluating us. It would be really hard to have the ego strength to be doing that. And why risk? It doesn't work. I mean, I've never seen it work. And I've treated swingers. It doesn't work. But to risk the relationship, and we're older, I do see in the younger folks, the idea of, is there someone out there better? Um, settlers and reachers. A settler is someone who settles for a partner and a reacher is someone who has a quote unquote better partner. And I don't know what the evaluation criteria for that are, but they are looking and a lot of it is social media. You know, if I'm on TikTok all day and seeing all these beautiful people you know, maybe my partner doesn't look that great, but um, finding real love is so worth it. And staying in that space with your partner, with everything about him that is wonderful and annoying. And, you know, you just, <laughs> you know, going back to love as the driving force in the brain, you know, the driving force in the brain is not testosterone. Sex is near there in the brain. But it's not the driving force. It's not with hunger and thirst the way love is. And so I would say to people, if you can find that person that you love and do the hard work of understanding that person's childhood, their attachment style, 
their uh, neural personality structure, um, how dopamine affects them. I, I mean, it, it sounds kind of like you're in a science lab, but in that loving adventure, understanding their childhood maps and their critical events maps, you know, what others have told them about themselves that have created themes. If they can do that work, then they'll know whether this person is a good friend or a good partner. We talked about be, about this in earlier episodes. So I did a little bit of research and I found st the stats were all over the place. You know, we talked earlier about people who can't attach or love or for whatever reason, they haven't been able to have to create a relationship. But in married gay couples, specifically male couples, I've seen stats that as high as 60 percent nationally are open. So it's so prevalent now that when we meet new couples, you know, Ty and I, I would say most of the time, if we get to know them decently, the question comes up, are you open within, you know, couples that have presumably found love. Mm. And so I'm and that. It really kind of shocks us. And wow. we're newer to the scene, but I'm just curious why you would think. So we, these people have found love, you know, the, that driving biological need Yet, it looks like close to the majority of people in our community still, when they get there, will want to be open or explore others. Why do you think that is? I don't know. It's stunning and disappointing mm -hmm. to hear that. Yeah. I know uh, gay couples who are very much in love in closed relationships that work for them. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know if there's some dis degree of dissatisfaction. You know, marriage, from my perspective, is about monogamy. Um, and so I would, on an individual basis, I would wonder, what was that pairing about? If the pairing was mm -hmm. about safety. So, for example, I'm a younger person who is with an older man uh, for safety and security. And as that man ages, maybe, you know, I lose interest. I, I'm hypothesizing, but an open marriage usually is fraught with complications because inevitably the attraction is going to be more or less for one of the partners. And that's mm -hmm. wounding. Sure. Really and wounding. that's what? That's it's wounding. wounding. You know, if 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 I have an open relationship and a, a third party comes in who is more attractive to my partner, well, I don't know about you. I don't have the ego for that. I promise I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the mm -hmm. first relationships I was in when I came out as I was just trying to figure out what in the world was going on. I was actually in a relationship with someone who was in an open marriage mm -hmm. and I had tremendous attraction for him and vice versa. And I think ironically, I mean, at the end of the day, we were probably a better match than his husband was. Mm -hmm. We had more in common mm -hmm. and it was the biggest disaster. In what way a disaster? Well, after three months, uh, this person told me that he thought he was in love with me and wanted to leave his husband. Mm -hmm. And those were not the rules that everyone agreed to. Mm -hmm. And a home wrecker. Yeah. I mean, I was completely out of integrity for myself, even in the situation. I was just trying to be open to what came my way. And I was exploring, trying to find my own way. Yeah. Um, but I definitely, you know, developed very strong feelings for him as well and didn't care for his husband at all. So, it was a really, really painful experience for everyone involved. And we had to, and I'm proud of us at the end of the day. I said, we need to stop this and you all need to work on your marriage because they've been together for 11 years at that point. And I think to this day, they're still together and I'm sure doing fine. But that experiment with grown, educated people who met well backfired horribly. So what that feels like to me is tacit approval for the relationship. And it becomes an affair when he falls in love with you. How do you calibrate that? How do you know at that moment when the third party inches up past mm -hmm. the established dyad? How do you know that? So yeah. my counsel would be find big love, hold on to it. Let your brain do exactly what it is driven to do. <laughs> to be loving and stay loving and yeah. examine why you get married. You know, if, if, if it is for safety and security, no, I'm not good. It enough. needs to be for love. It needs to be for love, for friendship, for shared values, 
for um, for better, for worse. You know, when when Mm -hmm. your partner ages or decays or, you know, becomes incompetent or medically fragile, you know, that's what love looks like. So Mm -hmm. um, and in today's world where that might seem old fashioned or traditional, it's just simply how we as humans are wired. Yes. And it worked. Um, It works. It works. Again, it's anecdotally. I've not looked at the research on, you know, multi-partner couples, Um, but anecdotally uh, with folks that I see in my office, swinging has never worked. It has always been a disaster outcome, as you put it in your own experience. So, you know, I'd be loath to tell a couple, yeah, go ahead and try that. The the word novelty comes up that you mentioned that with um, Helen Fisher, oh, the word novelty, novelty it uh-huh. was mentioned in there. Yeah. And that's some of what I hear, mm-hmm. you know, and I was just thinking about, you know, when was the last time you lit a candle? When was the last time you took a bath together? When was the last time you had a weekend getaway or a vacation for just the two of you? When was the last time you kissed for more than five seconds? When was the last time, you know, talk to each other and put your phones down? Right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. beyond that, sucked and fucked him. Can I just, you, can you know say what it. I'm saying? When yeah. was the yeah. last time you laid on the couch together, you know, and watched a movie or held hands in the car or wrote him a yeah. love letter? We're responsible, I think, for that novelty. And it might seem woke to a lot of people. And that's the misinformation that really frustrates me that is being passed down to a younger generation is that it seems woke to be in an open relationship, that this is what we're evolving into. And I just think it is so unfortunate to understand what it means to go through thick and thin together. Uh, But this has been really, really helpful, Alicia. God, we're so glad to have you here. Would love to have you back again. And uh, it's been a pleasure, Alicia. I've learned quite a bit today. It's been amazing. Yeah. Matt is one month, just under a month away from his nuptials. I am. Oh, congratulations. Yes. Thank you. It's coming soon. I found big love and I'm going to hang on to it. I promise. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, Matt Squared, you guys are fun. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. We're doing Thanks. our best to change this community one gay at a time. That's right. And don't be afraid to look for that big love. You're worth it. You deserve a meaningful love. One, two, three, four. That's it for us today. For more bitchy wisdom, follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok at you guessed it, how to find and keep a gay man. And until we meet again, get a therapist, don't be an asshole, protect yourself, call your mom, and remember that you deserve a meaningful love. Bye!